Amen. I greet you all in the lovely name of the Lord Jesus. <clears throat> and uh, it's good to be here today in the presence of the Lord and uh, just waiting on God and seeing all your lovely faces out there waiting, ready to hear from, from God. So we pray God stirs our hearts as we look into His Word. Um, what I've been out of my heart to share, and I'm not quite sure how it's going to pan out, because every time I think of it, it comes out slightly differently. So I'm just going to launch out there and, and allow the Lord to, to lead us. But uh, the main thing that's been on my heart is um, looking to God to open doors for us um, and which doors we should uh, pursue and which doors we should knock on for, for God to open. It's obviously obvious that God has called us with a great calling um, and He has a purpose and a, a calling on your life and He's going to open doors for you to um, function and to pursue what that calling for, for your life. And they're going to be great and wonderful and effectual doors that God has. Um, but of course, we have to be willing to, to, to go there. We've got to be willing to, to open the doors and to stand before the doors that God has got for us. Um, the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. So we have our free will and uh, we have a, a desire, obviously, to, to serve God because God has, has saved us and he's opened a, a wonderful door for us as his children, um, but we get influenced by the world and we get influenced by our own heart, but at the same time we're getting influenced by God all the time. So our willingness should remain and our willingness should, should actually become more and become greater because the, the, the scripture says it's God that works in us to will and to do of his good pleasure. So it's actually God working in me to make me not only to do His will, but to be willing to do His will. And then it says, so work out your salvation with fear and trembling um, because God is working in, in your heart. And so we need to work out, or we need to respond or act upon what God is doing. So <clears throat> I just want to turn you to John chapter 10 first. And then um, just have a look at, at, at some of the, the doors that God has already opened for us and that is his desire to continue uh, in our lives. Um, if we go to John chapter 10 and verse... Uh, seven, he said, <laughs> Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. Verily means truly. So Jesus, we cannot lie, and it is the word of God, says, Truly, truly, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. So he's He's repeating himself three times because he's saying what he's saying and then he says it's true and then he says it's true again. I am the door of the sheep. Jesus is our door. I don't know if you've stood before some doors at some stage with great trepidation um, and not wanted to go in. I remember going into the, the vice head principal's office a couple of times. You know, when we were children, when, when, when we were this size, uh, life was ruthless <laughs> because um, our discipline was handed over to others who didn't care for us to discipline us. So I stood with great trepidation, not so much the first time, but after the first time, <laughs> because then I knew what was coming. And there was a great fight in this line as to who's going to be in the front and who's going to be at the back, and you weren't sure. No, there was actually always a fight to be in front because you wanted to get it over with first. 
they didn't have to listen to the other guys getting whacked uh, with a rod and knowing that you are going to now follow. So um, Marcus and Danielle stood before a door just a little while ago, the door of the theater. And I'm sure there was some trepidation in going to, uh, through that door. And guys like Franco have to try and calm, pacify the poor people that are going to be put under and so forth. Um, but yeah, so there's some doors that we, and then there are other doors that we're excited to go into, but we actually have a backlash when we go in there. And we, we are sorry that we ever went into that door. Um, and I want to speak a little bit about that as well today. But Jesus says, yeah, I am the door um, of the sheep. So in other words, he's the door into God's presence. For us, and in this context, he says he's talking about the sheep and the shepherd, and he says he's the door into the sheepfold where the sheep are together and they're in a safe place and they're cared for. And he says, I am the door, truly, truly, I say unto you, I'm the door of the sheep. So, in other words, no one can come to the sheep but through Jesus, who is the care carer of the sheep. So, I, I can't even. I can't even come to you um, as my brother or sister in Christ unless I come through the Lord Jesus to you. I can't even come to my own children or my own wife to touch their spirit unless I come through the Lord Jesus because he is the door of the sheep. And unless I function in his word, I cannot really have access to the innermost depths of the heart. So Jesus says, I am the door of the sheep. We know that he said later on, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Um, Jesus, when he came, was obviously born of a virgin. He came through the veil into this world without sin um, because he was born of the Holy Spirit. Um, and he came into this world and lived then without sin, without sinning at all, and think to the cross, he dies upon the cross. And this is, this is the way in which we go to God, because we've all sinned, and every man has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So we had to go through the door of the Lord Jesus. And, and there on the cross, um, Jesus' arms were stretched out, in a sense, to the whole world to welcome them and to show them the love of God towards them. But you know, the, the arms. The hands speak of all the things that we hold on to, isn't it? Uh, all the, the treasures of this life and all the, the, the um, plans and ambitions that I have for this, all the things that I hold on to, these are the things that I want and these are the things that I, I'm going to get. Isn't it strange that Jesus never held on to anything in this life and yet his hands were, were broken, his hands were pierced. He was imprisoned because of what I was holding on to. And, and the feet speak of all those things that we stand on, all the things that form a foundation in our lives, that, uh, you know, the, 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 my family, uh, the economy of the country, the, the world that I walk on, the stability of this earth that I walk on, it's, it's a sure foundation to me. I feel solid and I feel secure in what I'm standing on. But, you know, I, 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 I really lean on those things and I rely on them as though they are what's holding me up, but they're not. And even though I stood on things and relied on things that were not things to rely on, and Jesus never relied on anything that he shouldn't have, he only relied on his Father, yet his feet were pierced. And my feet today are going free. So, we, you know, when we look at the cross, and we can look at the cross and what happened to the cross, and it's, 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 if we don't look at that and we don't understand that, then we don't understand the door that God has opened for us into, into uh, His presence. What happened to Him? What happened to the Savior? The Bible says we love Him because He, he first loved us. If I don't know how much he loves me, then I'm not going to love him. But God, who was 
who gave permission for me to come to this earth and um, gave permission for me to live a life in a particular time and in a particular place, that God has become my Father. And that Lord, the one who, who created me, who's my creator, he became my Savior and he became my brother. That's the door that God has opened for us. And God has an open door policy. Right into his presence, you can come and I can come because of what the Lord Jesus has done. What, an, what a wonderful door that God has opened for me. Um, not into the presence of a king on this earth or whoever, the heroes of the earth, but God has opened a door for me into his own presence. What a wonderful, wonderful door that God has opened for me. Um, and I need to, as I said, pursue that relationship that God has. Uh, you know, a relationship is something that you have to work on, isn't it? Um, husbands and wives have to work on their relationship. Children and parents have to work on their relationship. Otherwise, that relationship drifts apart. And the Bible says, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation. Now, to neglect something, it doesn't mean that you cast it aside or that you don't use it. You know, my car, I use it and I'm very fond of my car. But I've neglected it because it's quite dirty at the moment. Uh, it needs a new battery and so forth. Yeah, I'm saving water. Thankfully. So, ne neglecting something is not giving it all the attention that you should. Neglecting the Lord and neglecting our salvation is something that can happen very easily because of all the other doors that are open to us. So, <coughs> Jesus says here uh, in John chapter 10, so to read the first few chapters, uh, first few verses in verse 1. It says, Verily, verily, I say to you, he that enters not in by the door into the sheepfold, but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. He that enters in by the door, this is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter opens, and the sheep hear his voice, he calls his own sheep by name, and leads them out. Okay? And when he puts forth his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. Do you understand what things, these things are that God is saying? He's saying, in this sheepfold and in this place of safety, there's a somebody that stands at the door and opens the door for you. It's called the porter. And the one who opens doors for us is the Holy Spirit. He will open and he will close doors. And he won't open for a stranger, but he will open for the voice of the shepherd. So he opens the door for the sheep to follow the shepherd out to find pasture. And they follow him because they're familiar with him. They know him and they know his voice, so they follow him and he brings them back. They go in and out, and uh, they find pasture. But when a stranger comes in to that fold, what are the sheep going to do? They will scatter. They will run away, because they don't know the voice of a stranger. But then he goes on, and he says later on, um, He says um, in verse 12, But he that is an hireling and not the shepherd, his own the sheep or not, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf catches them and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is an hireling and cares not for the sheep. I'm the good shepherd, I know my sheep, and I'm known of mine. So, if there's somebody else that we place in charge of our lives, and not Jesus Christ, what's going to happen? When the wolf comes, 
he will come in because that person that's standing at the gate to lead the sheep out is not the true person. He's going to run away. And then the wolf can come in or the sheep can go out and then the wolf catches them and the wolf scatters them. Or if the wolf comes in amongst us, it will cause us to be scattered. So it's funny that the wolf is able to get to the sheep. The sheep don't listen to strangers and they don't follow strangers, but somehow the wolf is able to come in amongst them and scatter them and catch them. This is the Lord Jesus speaking about his sheep. And there's a warning in the scripture here that we can look at because Paul actually says the same thing to us about wolves that will come in and tear the sheep apart, cause them to be scattered. And the church at large today. God has opened the door for us and he's put us inside his body, inside his church. And he is building us up and he's keeping us and he's saving, saving us and keeping us. But you know that the enemy would like to come in amongst us and he would like to destroy us. We'd like to destroy our lives. We'd like to break the foundations of this body and he'd like to burn this house down. That's his desire. And he'd like to scatter you and he'd like to eat you. Because later on Jesus said that the thief comes not but to, to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I am come that you might have life. That you might have it more abundantly. So where's the safe place to be? Not just in the fold, but next to the, the shepherd. That's the safe place to be. Or next to those rams that have got big and strong. Uh, I've seen a ram knock a, a dog or a wolf flying through the air. Or a stranger that will come in, a big ram, they're able to knock them out of the sheepfold. Especially when it's mating season or something like that. <laughs> So, so let's just go and look back at the, at, the, at the doors that God opened in the beginning because he opened a door for Adam and Eve. Genesis chapter, chapter 2. Uh, Genesis chapter 2, it says in verse 16, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you will not eat of it, for in the day that you eat thereof you will surely die. So, if we look at the Look at the Garden of, of uh, Eden. The trees look like sheep, eh? I learned how to draw a tree when I was in grade two. Three grade, grade one. <laughs> So in the in the garden there was the tree the trees and all the trees of the garden and those trees bore fruit and herbs and seed for the people to eat and then there was also the tree there was a tree of the knowledge of good and evil what color shall we make that fruit? Red, black. <laughs> and there was also the tree of life. And these were in the middle of the garden. And uh, God said, you know, of all these trees that are here, and, and I'm sure there were 
And if you just look at the fruit trees that we have today, there, there were probably thousands of trees in the garden. God said you can eat of all of them, and you can also eat of the tree of life. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you may not eat of it. So, if Jesus says that um, when we come into the garden, and now we don't come into the garden of Eden, we come into the to heaven and into heavenly places, and we don't eat of this tree that they had there in the garden of Eden, but we eat of the Lord Jesus, the tree of life that is in heaven. Um, so we can come and and we can come into the garden, which is which is also a picture of the sheepfold or the pasture. And there's a person that stands at the door of the garden. And Jesus actually says that he is the door. He is the door into the heavenly garden that, and into the heavenly pasture. But there are other trees yeah, upon the earth that we can eat of as well. And there are people that stand as, as doors to those trees. And they are guardians of the garden or custodians of the garden. So whenever you go to a tree and it's the tree of, of uh, health, Or the tree of education, as we spoke about a little bit earlier, or the tree of business. God said we can partake of all these these trees, and God has given us richly all things to enjoy in this in this world. But the problem is with people, it's fine to draw knowledge from people and to draw input from people's lives. I had lots of teachers when I was growing up, and I drew a lot of knowledge from them. Uh, the problem with people in the world is that people in the world also are affected by the knowledge of good and evil. So every person is a door uh, to something. And every door that we're going to open or, or have open in our life is going to involve a person or people that we're going to be involved with. And people would like us to, par to partake with them of the knowledge of good and evil. Now the knowledge of good to those that don't know God and don't have is really to turn to your own righteousness and your own uh, ability to try and have a, a, be a good person or be a righteous person. And the evil, obviously, is the sin that they want to draw us into to partake of. So, what I'm, what I'm getting at here is that when we're asking God to open doors for us and we're going to look for, for God to open, those doors are going to be people. Or they're going to involve people. And we want to interact with people, don't we? As children of God, do we want to interact with people? We do want to. Uh, because we want to see people safe and we want to see people come into the, she the sheepfold and partake of the, the tree of life. The tree of life. But the problem is that people have this access also to sin. So when we look at people being a door, uh, they can either be a door, these people here that are believers and eat of the tree of life, they will be a door into the presence of God. The people that eat of the tree of the knowledge and evil will also be a door, but they will be a door that will lead down to they will be a door that will lead down to hell. A hell is a prison. It's a place where dead spirits are kept. So hell is a prison place, waiting for the time of judgment. And obviously there's a door to, to hell. Uh, and Jesus has the keys, by the way, of that, of that door. But people are doors, and those people will cause us to be drawn away from God. So Jesus says when he speaks to the church, he said, let no man take your crown. That God, let no man close the door that God has opened for you 
into the prison. So these are the doors. So, so we're looking to God to open doors for us. We're looking to God to open people's hearts for us because we want to grow. No, we don't want to grow in number. We don't want to grow our numbers. We want to be sold, saved from hell. That should be our desire. Not to grow in numbers. I'd rather that there were three people here that love God and are willing to die for Him, like Meshach and Shadrach and Abednego, than 300 people that are lying on the beach all day long. I'd rather that there were three. I'd rather that there were three people that sincerely love Jesus and can give to me the way of life. I'd rather be one of Noah's eight than part of the somewhat million that went to, to hell at that time. So, so we need to know who the true disciples of God are, uh, what the true word of God is, and we need to know the true people of God when we associate with them. Obviously, we need to know the shepherd of our souls, the Lord, the Lord Jesus. So, uh, you may say, well, that sounds, sounds a bit harsh. Well, I'm going to share some words with you that maybe are a bit harsh, but they're not my words. They're the words of the Lord Jesus. So I'd rather have three people here that are willing to take a big cross every day, deny themselves and follow Jesus, and have 300 people that are sitting on their bum, playing their PlayStation all day. Would you have that as well? Is that your desire? This is my desire. Matthew chapter 7, Jesus says this. So in verse uh, 6 of chapter 7, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before the swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. Who is Jesus speaking about? He's talking here about false prophets and Wise men and foolish men, isn't it? He says, don't cast them. Now let's go to Philippians, Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 1, he says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. Then he says in verse 2, Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. Who is he speaking about? Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. The concision were the circumcision or the Jews that were telling the people that they needed to be circumcised. The Bible says, now beware of them. Because you want to reach out, you want to have friends and draw people in to the Lord. Now when I, when I see, look at the church at large today, uh, I wouldn't feel comfortable to go into many places and I haven't been comfortable in many places. Because the people the churches are full of pain and Ishmael that desire to, to kill me, to destroy me. That's their desire. They didn't desire to build me up. They didn't desire to give me life. They didn't desire to love me. So what has happened? Where have all these wolves come from? Where have all these dogs come from? How did they come in amongst the people of God? The hirelings maybe let them in, eh? The false prophets and false teachers. 
that heap, people heap to themselves teachers, telling them in the last days what they want to hear. But Paul says, beware of men in the last days, because men will be covetous, boasters, proud. They will be without self-control. They will be violent. They will be haters of those that are good. So, there are many other examples that we can use um, in the Bible, but John turned to those people that came to him to be baptized, and he said, you, generation of snakes, vipers, who want you to flee from the wrath that is to come. So what did you do if you stand before uh, the religious people of the day or the, the religions of the day? Who are those people that are leading all those people at stake? What are they? God sees them for who they, they are. Those ISIS people there that are killing Christians, what are they? What did you say to them? What did you call them? Murderers. They're murderers because they've killed our brothers and sisters. You know what? Jesus spoke straight to people that he dealt with. And so did Paul, and so did the disciples of the Lord Jesus. And they were full of the Holy Ghost when they, when they, when they spoke to people. So, <clears throat> let's just go back to John chapter 10. You see, the problem is that we sometimes talk to people. How many people in Durbanville would you go to and talk to and, and think that they are going to get saved when you present them with the gospel? How many of them have responded? What are they interested in? In buying and selling? In building and planting? In marrying and giving in marriage? That's what their lives revolve around. And when they come into the church, they are looking for something. And I'm telling you now, it's not the Lord Jesus that they are looking for. And it's not the people of God to build them up and to give them life. So Jesus says in John chapter 10, um, in verse 16, And other sheep I have, John chapter 10 and verse 16, and other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there should be one fold and one shepherd. Now, of all your ten neighbors that you might reach out to, or the ten people at work, you might find that one will respond, but he won't respond in a way that you think he's just going to give his life to the Lord Jesus and be this perfect Christian. No. They're not going to respond like that. They're going to look for ways to use you and to abuse you first until God changes the nature. You know, when Jesus sent the disciples out, he sent 70 out into Israel and said, now go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And he said, but listen, beware. I send you as sheep amongst the wolves. Then you have land amongst the, the world. Beware of men. Because men, and those that have been given over to a reprobate mind, they are children of the, the devil. And Jesus called those religious people there that weren't leading people into mercy and into faith and into judgment, that they were straining at a gnat and swallowing a camel, what did he say to them? Polishing the outside, leading people astray. He said to them, you are of your father, the devil, and the works of your father, you will do them. And uh, the similar thing we see today, people that are supposed to be leading the churches and leading the churches, but they have eyes full of adultery, they cannot cease from sin. Pray God that 
our hearts are kept pure before the Lord, that we walk before the Lord as children of God, and that when we lead people, we don't lead them down the wrong path, up the garden path, but we lead them into the presence of our Savior. And Paul said to the, to the disciples at Ephesus, um, take heed, take care of the flock of which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers, to feed them, and beware, because I know this, that after my departing, grievous wolves will come in amongst them, and they will not spare the flock. And even of yourselves will arise wolves that will not spare the flock. So you say, well, God has placed us here, and if you've been here for a while, then God has given you the ability to look, to know the people that are amongst you, and to know their hearts. The Holy Ghost has made you overseers over the flock of God. You've been around for a while. You're not stupid. You can see that God, what, what is happening with the believers. So, <clears throat> he says, other sheep I have. So, of those ten, of course, you must go and look for that one that God wants to bring in. And you need to train them in the way of the Lord. Jesus said, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. But to some of them, when you speak to them, it will be parables. And some of them, when you give them a sign, it won't be a sign of a miracle. It will be this sign, the sign of Jonah. Jesus died, he was buried, and he rose again. So I'll look at you, what does that mean? What is that supposed to mean? And I said to them, why don't you understand? Why can't you see? If you don't open your heart to God, it cannot open. Uh, and I'm not going to try and force that heart to open. I'm not going to deal with that person and, and bring them in until God opens their heart and their eyes. So, of, of course, look for that one out of the ten that will respond and, and, and have a relationship with them. Uh, because all heaven rejoices when one comes in to the presence of our God. When one spirit is taken and is made alive before God, his sins are washed away. Heaven rejoices. Heaven rejoices. And there will be a crown in heaven for you if you bring that soul with you into the presence of God. So yeah, we need to have compassion. But at the same time, it says, others pluck from the fire, hating even the garment that is spotted from the flesh. So in a sense, you're reaching out to them and you're grabbing them, but you don't even look at the garment or the mind of the person because the mind is corrupted and it will corrupt you. Tell me if I'm standing up here and I'm trying to pull people up here, is it easier to pull me down or is it easier to pull the people up? It's easier to pull somebody off a chair that's standing on a chair or on a table. And so it's easier for us to be pulled down than what it is to pull them up. So we need to be, make sure that we are secure standing together when we pull somebody up and that we don't look down when you're pulling them down because you might fall into that hole that they want you to be in. May God give us grace to see those souls that need to be saved. Amen. That's the thing for today. I pray to my heart. May God will bless, bless it to our hearts and cause us to be strong in the grace of the Lord and the power of His might. Uh, can we maybe hand over to Pastor Dion and just pray for us in closing? I don't know if somebody else wants to say anything. Cool.